Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. For those of you who are new here, my name is Jane. I'm so happy to have everyone here. Uh, I wanted to do a very quick, simple talking head video where we talk about manifestation during eclipses. Good idea, bad idea, yay or nay, where are we at, right? Pretty much every single astrologer, tarot reader, practitioner of any kind of magic will say, don't do it. Okay. Uh, because there's an obstruction of light. This is why, right? Cause it has to do with light astrology. Um, and even just life itself here on earth completely depends on light from the sun, especially. So when there is an obstruction from what, right? Because when we have, let's say an, a, a, a new moon eclipse, right? That's the moon coming in between the earth and the sun. And then when we have a full moon eclipse, that's the earth coming in between the sun and the moon, right? So there's just kind of a, a, a specific configuration here that when the moon, the moon's axis and the ecliptic intersect, north node, south node, when the moon's orbit and the ecliptic intersect, that means that there is an alignment between the sun, the earth, and the moon. That's all an eclipse is. So with, with an obstruction, when it's either the earth or the moon coming in between either the earth or the moon, depending on which type of an eclipse we're talking about, um, the sun's light, the sun's energy creates different, there's like differentials, right? So we have, uh, either a discoloration or a shadow being cast on the moon or we have a shadow coming over the sun, which as you can imagine in ancient times, this may have been a very scary omen, right? And that, uh, the, the omens that they used, you know, divination, right? Because in ancient, ancient times, uh, astrology was used less scientifically and more for divination. So it was a little bit more like how we use the tarot cards today to a degree. And that would have been a scary omen, like a tower card or like a death card or even a devil card. And it would have basically been interpreted as there are going to be challenging events ahead or in, in the upcoming period of weeks or months or whatever it was. Um, and so that's why people always say, right. And usually during these times of eclipses, there are big world events that happen as well. There, you know, we have, a midterm election here in the United States. We have a situation happening in Iran. We have issues in, you know, the Ukraine with Russia. We have stuff going on internally with our own internal politics. Uh, there's just a, like a, a lot brewing. And I think a lot of things are going to come to a head over the course of the next month because it is eclipse season. So this is why people say, don't do it during this time. The energy is dark. It is too uh, disconnected because actually the nodes, like if you know the story of, of Rahu, the demon God, right? Uh, back when Vishnu was creating the world, right? He had the demons and he had the gods. The gods were like the planets and he decided to immortalize the gods, but he didn't want the demons to have this, right? He created this elixir of immortality. And as the gods were lining up, to partake of this elixir of immortality, he had to distract the demons. So he, you know, disguised himself in a specific way to, to capture their attention. But Rahu figured out what was going on and was a little too smart. We call him the dragon demon. Okay. He was a little bit too smart to figure out what was really going on. Um, so he got in line with the gods and sort of slithered his way through and was able to get a single drop on his tongue of this elixir. And at, as this was happening, Vishnu realized what was happening and came and cut him in half, right? So now Rahu was destined to remain in half for all time and eternity. So these are the nodes. We have the dragon's head, Rahu, the North node, and the dragon's tail, South node, Ketu in Vedic astrology. So that's kind of what this is. So, so there's like this being split in half. So there's a lack of wholeness 
that happens here. And that's why the North Node can be this very, this is why we say it's like a destiny point, right? Not because it's some magical, mystical, beautiful point of fate in our chart. It's because we have this extraordinary, greedy desire to get to that place, right? Like let's say someone has you know, a North node in let's say the ninth house. This is someone who is going to just like consistently consume information and try to expand their consciousness. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, right? To, to go and to learn about all sorts of religions, or let's say you specialize in a topic like, um, I don't know, maybe you're really into like learning about butterflies or something, right? So you go in and you specialize and you go in and, and you can sit conti continually, uh, you know, you, maybe you go through like a full PhD or a doctoral program or something, and you continually get smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. This is like this, this insatiable desire to grow your consciousness and to grow your mind, to grow yourself spiritually. Um, this is someone who would love philosophy and who would love to travel and to experience all sorts of different cultures, right? There's this insatiable desire there. And then the South node, just a tail, right? There's no head there. So there's no senses. And I often argue that K2 or the South node is actually the most spiritual point in our chart, has a lot to do with how we kind of are detached from almost everything because we cannot perceive it. And we don't have a very good sense of reality in that particular area of our chart. So when the eclipses are involved and there is this alignment going on, it's like we're being kind of tossed and turned and swayed from like one half of ourselves to the other half of ourselves. And it is very unstable. All right. And it indicates a lot of our polarity and being, you know, technically this is going to be happening in Scorpio season, but as we are building up, we of course have to make our way through Libra season and Libra season right now is, is really asking us to find as much stability and balance as we possibly can. And this is not only important for the upcoming Libra, uh, upcoming eclipse in Scorpio and Taurus, but also for next year when the nodes transition, because that south node is going to be coming into Libra and stability and balance and order are going to be very difficult to come by. Okay. Now, um, the point that I would argue, okay, because this, these are the reasons why like not like don't manifest during these times. This is why I would argue against that a little bit. Um, we, okay. I'm just trying to think of how to really say, <laughs> how to really say this, but first of all, I don't think this is a good time to initiate or launch or to try to manipulate situations. Okay. This is a terrible time for that. So if you were going to launch a business or launch a big website or launch a big, you know, campaign or a new product or something, I don't, I don't know that like a huge grand entrance is a good idea. If you want to do like a little soft launch, you know, like let's say you were opening a restaurant, you know, instead of announcing it to all the local, you know, news networks and newspapers and local entertainment magazines and all that and saying, we're open, we're open, th that would be you know, you probably would have a lot of problems with the launch, but if you were to soft launch and allow yourself to like work out the kinks, that's fine. Okay. That's just you kind of living your life and opening your doors and getting everything straightened out. Um, and then you can do like a big launch during say Sagittarius season when Jupiter is in rulership and there's a whole bunch of wonderful things that could potentially happen. That would be fantastic. Okay. And I certainly don't think, you know, like casting a spell, if you will, and saying, okay, well, I want this specific person to love me back. First of all, that's not high quality magic anyway. That usually and in general leads to really difficult and toxic situations. Um, never advise for that, but I especially do not advise for that during Scorpio season. Okay. Or during eclipse season rather. Okay. Um, but here's the little, but that I kind of am trying to get to. So 
When you really think about it, even though there is an obstruction of light during an eclipse season, there is still an alignment. The sun, the earth, and the moon. Now in traditional astrology, the sun and the moon are like the most important. It's like everything revolves around the sun and the moon. All astrology is based on the relationship between these two. Well, they're not technically planets. I always say planets, but you know, they're, they're the luminaries. Um, and everything revolves around them pretty much. So when these two things are in alignment, specifically if we're having like a total eclipse versus a partial. Now a total eclipse has to do when like there's like a complete, you know, kind of shadow being cast over the sun, rather like a partial where it's kind of like that, right? So it's like either a little bit or a little corner of it or the whole thing, right? That the total is like a perfect alignment. So the sun, which often represents our spirit and the ambitions of our soul as per traditional astrology and the moon, which has to do with our physical bodies, one, but also our emotional bodies and our creative essence and our more, um, temporary existence, which is our human form. And then the earth, which is our home and the environment in which all of this is happening. To me, I'm like, well, if there's an alignment, like we're talking about being in alignment all the time. So when we're in alignment and we are astrologically aligned as well, there could be something powerful here. Now, while I'm, I'll reiterate, I don't recommend like initiating or launching something huge or doing something to try to get something from someone. All right. This is not a time to try to get stuff. This is a time to manifest what you want, but rather than focusing on what you want, you focus on what needs to be destroyed in order to get yourself there. All right. Because the reason there's a gap between where you are and where you want to be is because there's something in the way. There's something up here, most likely, right? There is a, a mental obstruction. Now this new moon eclipse, which is happening on October 25th at two degrees of Scorpio. This is the first deacon or decan, as some people pronounce it. You may hear me switching back and forth. Now the decans, deacons are, there's three deacons per zodiac sign, each 10 degrees. And this particular deacon is ruled by Mars using traditional rulerships or Pluto using modern rulerships. So it's either Mars or Pluto. Either way, we know that both planets are highly destructive and it's in Scorpio, right? Which is also ruled by Mars and Pluto. So we have that to contend with as well. So because this is a new moon, this is the beginning of a creative cycle. This is where the south node is, which is the tail, right? Which is our most spiritual point in our chart. There's a lot of detachment and separation, and there's a lot of, you know, kind of release that happens here. So when we kind of combine those concepts and we say, okay, I want the love of my life. I want to have a multi-billion dollar business. I want to have, you know, whatever your thing is, I want to have that thing and I am manifesting that thing, not through discovering a path to get there, but rather tearing apart everything that bridges the gap between me and that thing. Right? So it's kind of like the wrinkle in time. Did you guys ever read that book? It was an old book. I think I read that in like fourth or fifth grade or something where it was like, you know, they, they, you can visualize time as being like this string and we can, instead of using time, what we can do is take that line and say, this is your manifestation. Here you are today. Here is the manifestation, which we perceive it as where we want to be. And instead of trying to cross it by walking all this way, what we can do is we can just fold it. Right. And then there's this loop down here and then where we are and where we want to be are much, much, much closer together. Do you see that? So if you were to like actually take an actual string, 
hold it like this and then move it like this, you're like, oh, okay, so, so that's all we're doing. That's what manifestation through destruction can really look like. Now, when I say destruction, I know that's like a terrible word and the general uh, definition of destruction is not the best, right? It's like complete destroying. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be destroying your life, but you are going to destroy the unhelpful narratives, the unhelpful fears, and the unhelpful traumas and wounds that you're continuing to hold on to that are preventing you from just being the type of person that has that thing. If manifestation is all about vibration, which I think by now science has proven that that is the case, right? And we see our initial um, kind of, or the most immediate forms of manifestation is a lot in our body, right? And when we are holding on to vibrations of stress and pain and hatred and revenge and all sorts of lower vibrational emotions, that tends to make our body sick. Whereas if we hang on to or attach ourselves to vibrations of love and gratitude, compassion, honor, pride, success, all the more positive things, we tend to be healthier, right? So our physical body is like the perfect representation of how manifestation actually works. I feel like I've learned a lot about this because I have been deep in study with all of this for the past two years, just given my kidney failure and all that kind of stuff that I was going through, um, going through dialysis, going through chemotherapy, and then coming off of all of that, and then going through it again for a second time. And this time it actually... I feel like it's actually a completely different healing process because I'm understanding the difference between what I did then and what I'm doing now. And all my numbers are looking so much better. And I'm like, okay, well, I think I really understand what's really going on here intrinsically, like in my bones, right? So what's really needing to happen though is release. And if, if you are not... Uh, I mean, if you don't, don't know, Scorpio rules elimination. Okay, now, now I'm going to have a different story for every single set of eclipses. Every time the nodes change, there will be a different way to go about manifesting because you have to understand the, the kind of the, the domicile that these nodes are in. So for... Uh, Scorpio, it is about destruction. And with Taurus, it is about creation. Okay, these are completely opposite polarities. But with the new moon eclipse coming up on October 25th, we have to embrace the destruction of the obstructions. Okay, we have to embrace the elimination of the pain, the elimination of the fear and all of those things, we have to find a way or ask for guidance. Okay. If that's all you do is just ask for guidance to eliminate this stuff, you will receive guidance. And it's not going to be easy. Uh, first of all, Scorpio is never, enter, never easy. It's kind of like Capricorn. It's like, it's just never an easy archetype to really deal with, especially if you aren't inherently born with a lot of Scorpio. I'll just like, okay, full disclaimer, I've got my Pluto, South Node, my Moon, and my Saturn all in Scorpio, and my Vesta also in Scorpio, conjunct Saturn, Moon conjunct Saturn, Venus square Saturn, Saturn being in Scorpio, my Venus is over in Leo, so like, I do have a, a lot of research under my belt regarding the Scorpionic archetype, just simply because of my own self-interest, okay, so the elimination factor is so crucial, but not everyone can handle it. If you don't think you can handle it, then don't do anything. Okay. Then, then just take everyone as vice and just don't manifest. Don't work. Don't, you know, just let the eclipses pass you by and you can work, do stuff next month. Okay. And then when we reach Taurus, all right, the, the full moon eclipse happening in Taurus, which is much more about creation, 
I think allowing yourself to be a little bit more greedy is a good thing, but I wouldn't do a manifestation rooted in greed. Like I want that money or I want that person to love me or like, no, you can just acknowledge that this is something that you genuinely want and relieve and alleviate the pain that you have around not having it. Okay. So another thing to think about is that usually the moon cycle, right? The moon cycle is like 28 days approximately. Now the nodal cycle is like 18 and a half years. So when we approach manifestation, I'm going to use that term very loosely because I don't want it to be confused with like a regular new moon ceremony. Okay. But when we approach a process of becoming during eclipse season, um, we need to think of our lives in terms of an 18 and a half year cycle, decades, really like a, a two decade cycle. And you have to be prepared for things to happen in a long-term fashion. You have to be prepared for things to take time. So again, when you're asking for the elimination of certain obstructions, which is not an easy process, it can be very challenging to go through that. And it can require someone to have fully embraced their darkest shadow. Like if you don't feel like you've fully embraced your shadow, then this is not for you. Okay. If you don't feel like you have done enough healing work, absolutely sit this one out. Um, but it's the people who are strong, the people who are self-aware, the people who are okay with release and loss. Those are the ones that are ultimately going to succeed the most during this time. And the ones who can have a long-term vision and who are willing to wait for it. Patience is so key. All right. Cause a node usually is going to want something right away. Cause especially the North node, cause there's that greed factor. It wants that immediate gratification, but you see the node is similar to like a, it's kind of like a mixture between Saturn and Neptune kind of energy kind of coming together. There's like a delusional component, but there's also like this desire to attain. And so we have this slow, delayed gratification. Like it's, it, you will have it. You will have the thing that you seek in your life. Um, but it will be delayed. All right. It's a delay, but never deny situation. All right. So we have to be okay with the delay and we have to be okay with just sort of allowing life to carry us there. Okay. So there's a lot of release of karma during this time too. And because Taurus is involved and Scorpio is involved, there could be a lot of tr issues of trust, true vulnerability, uh, reliance upon other people, trusting other people, sharing resources with other people, uh, sharing a life truly with other people, Scorpio, there's deep enmeshment with Scorpio energy, right? This is all about the energetic exchange, which can be beautiful if done with the right people. But if it is not done with the right people, it can be an absolute mess because Scorpio does not want to move on. See Scorpio, yes, it is about change and transformation, but it is a fixed sign right? And fixed energy does not like to budge. It doesn't like to move. It wants to preserve. And so when we have the relationship energetic component of Scorpio, it's like, you know, that feeling when you get into a brand new relationship and it's all butterflies and beautiful and wonderful and amazing. And then when things start to go sour, one of the reasons why you may continue with that relationship is because you're trying to get back to that time of innocence and purity and love and connection and belonging. Right. And so there's that constant desire to keep it at its best. And so when things start to get destroyed throughout the scorpionic archetype, that's why it can feel so like so much because the part of you that wants to preserve the good is having to give in to the reality that it is no longer good. 
Okay, so we have our illusions just absolutely crushed in Scorpio, all right? So if you're not operating in some semblance of reality, this can be like a really shocking time, um, especially right now when we have Mars in a square uh, with, with Neptune, okay? There is a little bit of that kind of delusional quality, but it's not gonna be allowed. So as much as we want to be in our fairy tale world, the stars won't let us, but we, we need to be in some semblance of reality so that we can get to where we need to get to. Okay. That was a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, but I just wanted to still do this video nonetheless, because I think it's so important because I, I don't want people who feel ready to change their lives to sit this one out because even though there's a long-term stretch with it, you know, um, it's, they can be highly productive because there is an alignment to a degree, right? There, I mean, we can't argue that the planets are aligned, uh, but, but we can't also pretend like it's magical and easy. No, it's not. But if you can stomach it, if you can withstand it, and if you can allow for a part of yourself that's hindering you to be destroyed, then this is the perfect time. It, it just is. Uh, so anyway, I, I know a lot of people may argue this point, uh, but given my personal journey and how I have been using eclipses through my physical healing journey, these are the, some of the, some of the conclusions that I have come to. Um, and we'll, and as the nodes change, like next year, when they move into Aries and Libra, there will be a different approach and a different way about going about using these. If you misuse eclipses, then they can be, um, it can, it can work against you. All right. So knowing the archetypes, understanding the archetypes and understanding the connection that it has in your own personal life is very, very important. You don't want to willy nilly go into this. It would also be really helpful for you to know which houses Scorpio and Taurus are in your chart using a whole house system specifically. Um, so let's say you have, you know, Scorpio in the 12th house and Taurus in the sixth house. Well, this is absolutely going to be about both spiritual and physical healing of the body and the spirit. If you have Scorpio in the 10th house, Taurus in the ninth house, this is going to be about maybe a, a more public life versus your private life, your career versus your family, uh, your, your worldly contribution versus your, you kind of what you do to satisfy yourself in your own time, right? So there's going to be a lot of different things accentuated in your life. For me, it's happening in my second house and my eighth house, which has a lot to do with, I mean, there are multiple themes to each houses. So please do your research. A second house has a lot to do with first and foremost, your sense of self value, your sense of survival, money, food. And then the eighth house has a lot to do with shared resources as well. Paying off debts, there's taxes, there's death, there's sex, there's all sorts of themes that could come out. So just make sure that you're understanding the themes that are accentuated in your life. Okay. All right, a lot more than I was expecting to say. Hopefully this was a little bit helpful for you. Um, I wish you nothing but the best, and I know there will be multiple videos that are gonna that I'm gonna publish personally on my channel between now and the 25th, so I'm sure you'll hear some reiterations of this as well throughout those videos. All right, thank you so much, guys. I love you, have a, an amazing week, and I'll talk to you soon.